Uh, we'll be able to answer questions and spend time getting to know one another. So please consider joining us this afternoon. If you have any questions, you can talk to me or anyone wearing one of our little solar crosses. Thanks. Where's the tea going to be? <laughs> In the parish life center. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Also happening in the Parish Life Center after the service, there's um, join us for coffee and conversation there. Um, for adult and during Lent, we're doing a series called Episcopal 101, and today the topic is how we read the Bible. Um, so come, come and learn and talk about that. Um, and then in the evenings, we have a Sunday supper series about pilgrimage through the places and services of Holy Week. So it's a chance to prepare us um, for all the different services. Um, and learn about their history and also looking at the text. And this year, um, the youth are going to be leading the prayers uh, and doing the readings on Palm Sunday, so we're really grateful to have them with us for that. And now let us pray together the hospitality blessing down on your feet. Holy Spirit,
commandment, the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Healing or standing, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess against you and God. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. 
stand in awe of them, O offspring of Israel, all of you of Jacob's line, give glory. For he does not despise our poor or in our poverty. Neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The Lord shall be to be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May their heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For the nation belongs to the Lord, the rules of the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's prayer. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has done. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. As for the promise that he would inherit the world, did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations. According to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
man who must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Returning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called a crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their lives for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord.
We can rage at God even as our soul lives and loves for God. We are not limited to one or the other. That would be a false binary. There aren't only two choices. There's this in between. We can feel these feelings in sequence or all at the same time. Some of us can measure our faith on a scale between one to 10. Some of us need to come up with our own process of sorting through what we know in our heads and what we feel deeply in our hearts and souls. There are so many strands that need to be disentangled before we can knit them into something coherent and tangible. This helps us understand how we get from the lament in the beginning of Psalm 22 to the praise at the end. An important part of making that connection is our own answer to the question that Jesus asks his disciples. It's not included in today's reading, but right before the passage we heard, Jesus asks his disciples, Who do people say that I am? They answer, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Then Jesus asks them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. This brings us to the big question. <coughs> who do you say Jesus is? So far in the Gospel according to Mark, we've also heard God call him Son. The unclean spirits call him the Holy One of God. The scribes claim he has Beelzebub. His disciples call him teacher, and the people in Nazareth refer to him as the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and his sisters. We've also heard Jesus refer to himself as the son of man and a prophet. Before us, there are many answers to the question, who do you say Jesus is? And whichever answer you agree with, follow-up question is, what does that mean to you, or for you? This week, the Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney, a Hebrew Bible scholar and an Episcopal priest I deeply respect, shared a picture of a banner hanging from the University Christian Church in San Diego. It reads, giving up bad theology for Lent. <laughs> Below that, it lists out the themes for each Sunday. This Lent, give up purity culture, the devil, biblical inerrancy, old guy in the sky, vending machine God, and getting saved. Now, if all of us here, all of us here decide to put our heads together and create our own series, we can probably come up with our own list. The theology we picked up depends on the kind of spiritual journey we've had. And if any of you are interested in pulling together a series like this for Lent next year, it's never too early for us to start brainstorming. <laughs> Ciao. Regardless, the road to bad theology is paved with misconceptions about who God is and what Jesus came here to do. Old guy in the sky is built on a father knows best, and this is all part of God's plan model that gives God all the praise and blame for everything that happens in the world. Humans aren't responsible for anything except to accept what's happening and listen to the men in charge. Vending machine God treats prayers and works as coins we put in a vending machine in order to get what we want. God is someone we can barter with, someone we can coerce into doing what we want. It treats salvation as something we can earn, and so we feel entitled to judge people for not doing what we think is necessary to earn it. Now we can specifically address each category of bad theology one by one, but we'll end up playing a, whack a game of whack-a-mole if we don't also address the underlying, the beliefs underlying the framework that leads to these kinds of conclusions. The great second century theologian Irenaeus of Lambs compares interpreting scripture to arranging a mosaic of precious jewels, or Legos, 
A skillful artisan, he says, will be able to arrange the precious jewels into the image of a king. A devious artisan will arrange those same jewels into the image of a fox and try to convince other people that it is the image of a king. Even when we're given the same pieces, the same verses of scripture, we may end up with very different pictures. The picture Jesus has of the Messiah is reflected in the work he's been doing. The Messiah teaches and heals and casts out demons and feeds the hungry. The Messiah proclaims the good news of God, saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The Messiah recruits disciples and empowers them to go out and teach and heal as he does. The picture Jesus has of the Messiah also includes future events that have yet to unfold. He teaches his disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and scribes, be killed, and rise again after three days. Hearing this, Peter has a lot of trouble matching up the picture Jesus presents with the picture that he has imagined. To Peter, for God to break into human history through the Messiah, that means the Messiah will be high priest and king. The Messiah will ride at the head of an army. The Messiah will restore the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom to Israel, so they will once again control their land and their economy. The Messiah will win a great victory that will free them from the yoke of the Roman Empire. Peter believes this because he hasn't quite grasped that the kingdom of God isn't simply a kingdom on earth that happens to be ruled by God. It's not about preserving the status quo while putting a different set of people on top. Jesus isn't trying to be high priest or king or president. The kingdom of God doesn't look the same, feel the same, or work the same as a kingdom on earth. It's not a kingdom built on might or manipulation of truth. It doesn't play on people's fears. It doesn't rely on walls or guns or threats of violence. It doesn't seek to force people into compliance. Fast forward to Palm Sunday, Jesus enters Jerusalem on a colt, and Pilate enters the city at the head of a column of an imperial army. These are two very different images of power and authority, two very different roads to peace and prosperity. Jesus didn't heal and teach the crowd so that they will join his army and march behind him. He taught and healed to show them that God has a different vision for this world and for their life together. That's why the authorities saw him as a threat, because he showed people that they didn't have to comply with the dominant narrative, with the way things have always been, always been in quotes. They can be co-creators of the kingdom of God here, on earth. The good news of God is that we can start rewriting our history at any time. When we repent and make that turn toward God, we're not just writing a new narrative. We can start living it. Following Jesus means taking up the cross. Speaking of images, even though in paintings we often see Jesus or other figures carry both the vertical and the horizontal beams of the cross, it is likely that they only carry the horizontal beam. The vertical beams just stayed in place, probably for practical reasons. The soldiers wouldn't have to reinstall them every time they crucified someone. And political reasons. It's a very visible threat to get people to do everything they can to avoid taking up that other beam that forms the cross. Looking at it this way, taking up the cross may look more like taking up a yoke. It looks like tethering ourselves to a particular vision of the world, an image of the Messiah, and of the kingdom of God we hope 
and trust will come to be. Jesus didn't end up on a cross because God put him there. Human beings put him on the cross because of the kind of Messiah he was, the kind of Messiah he chose to be. Political and religious authorities conspired to put him up there because he was a threat to the status quo, because an earthly kingdom they knew and could manipulate was better for them than the kingdom of God. Jesus' is suffering wasn't the price God demanded from him to forgive us. Death wasn't his goal. Life was. His death was the result of his efforts to point us toward a very different framework for living together. He encouraged us to care for one another and hold each other accountable without captivity or poverty or debts. He encouraged us to eat with those we pushed to the margin so we could hold on to some mythical notion of our own purity or superiority. And remember the crowd that showed up around him to be healed? None of us are as alone as we think we are, as we fear that we are. Who do you say Jesus is? The yoke you have taken up. Where is it leading you? When we follow Jesus, this journey will lead to the cross, and it will also lead to resurrection. We might keep repeating the Psalm 22 cycle of lament and praise and lament and praise. So every time we find ourselves crying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? May we also trust that there will be a day when we will we'll look back to this moment and share with future generations the saving deeds of God. Amen. Let us now stand and reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, on page 358 in the Book of Common Prayer. We believe in one God.
found on page 5 of your bulletin. We pray for the church. May she drink deeply from living springs and travel the deserts in trust and hope. Amen. We pray for the world. May we come to live as one family and grow beyond the violence of war. We pray for this nation. May we be healed of racism and shine again like a lamp on a hill. We pray for our community. May our children be safe, our leaders be wise, and our lives be peaceful and just. We pray for the afflicted. May every sadness find you at its heart. And may there be grace when the sun. God We pray for the departed. May they ever grow in faith and love. And may we always remember them by name. Special God of mercy, make us new. God of mercy, make us new. Change our hearts, mend our lives, and lead us to any who need us. For the sake of Jesus, Came that that all might have life and to have it abundantly. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Dip your wafer 
according to the cup or drink directly from the cup or cross your arms as the cup comes by. If you would like a blessing, come up, cross your arms, and I'll know if we give you a blessing. Thank you all for, for being here and for being part of St. Albans, and I'm so grateful for all those who, as I mentioned, already died on Tuesday, and we had a memorial, a memorial for him yesterday. And so thank you to Yachty and the choir and the Ultra Guild and, and everyone who came together um, to show Rosemary and the family how much they love. So thank you. And now let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labor to the Lord.
You, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctified by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, our honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, our Lord,
Standing and kneeling, let us pray together the post communion prayer on page 9 years old. Almighty and ever living God, we thank you for feeding us the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood. For your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who was conceived in the Holy Spirit, that we are living members of the body. Closing him is him 474. <laughs> 